today's show. You always want to feel like you're out of place. You always want to feel like you're biting more than you can chew. Um, obviously, there's dangerous situations. Uh, use your discretion. <laughs> it's funny because I always tell people, especially in the tech world, this is fine, right? But if you're like my sister-in-law, for example, she's an ophthalmologist, she's a doctor, uh, you can't really do that because people could die. Luckily, <laughs> in advertising, oh God, like, okay, you, you run an ad campaign where the click-through rate is like, you know, 0.5% lower. It's like, you know, no one's gonna die. Um, so it's, it's important to try. And what happens is when you try or you do, it stretches you, right? It pushes you to limits. And you understand what your limits are and you understand what you're capable of. And people who don't try don't know that they're capable of these things. Um, and they also don't realize that it also gives them a huge benefit. When you do take the initiative, when you do get in over your head, people do recognize you and they do go to you for that. Uh, so it's funny. I tell people who are younger and in big organizations, I'm like, what's stopping you from being the blockchain expert in the company? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> because no one else knows anything about it. So you might as well just read up about it. And as long as you're reading and learning just a little faster than the next guy or gal, then you're, you're in, mm -hmm. right? And these are perfect opportunities to try to position yourself and, and not even as an expert, actually, that's the worst way to do it. Just position yourself as the doer, you know, just throw me a project. I'm going to, I'm just going to do it. Five, four, three, two, one, one. What more can I say about Brian Wong? He is a force of nature. <laughs> it's a, we met several years ago back in San Francisco. And what I've loved about Brian ever since is he just exudes positivity, energy. And on this episode, we'll talk a lot more about his own experiences and sort of why this, you know, early 20s something decided, I'm going to write a book and how it sort of changed a lot of things for him in terms of giving him a way to uh, share his learnings through the cheat code. Uh, Brian is a Forbes 30 under 30 winner. He is the founder and CEO of Keep, which is a digital rewards company and, and really someone who continues to share and continues to get his word out there. Uh, you'll hear a lot about why he sort of is out there trying to think about the way that we communicate differently. And what I love about the way that he positioned his book, he thought about it is he's like, listen, I <laughs> I know my people and those people do not want to read long things. So he packaged this up into these small bite-sized chunks that now he uses uh, when he speaks and he talks. Uh, he's a great guy. And, and I would say he's one of those people that has really leveraged his youth, his enthusiasm to succeed. Uh, it's a fun, really conversation for me. And I think it's great to see Brian continuing to think about how he continues to share these messages and inspires more entrepreneurs like him. Brian Wong, everyone. Brian Wong. Man, I'm excited to have you here, my friend. Thanks so much for agreeing to hang out with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been it's been a while. I know um I feel like I feel like we were, you know, as we were talking beforehand, the uh the entrepreneurial grind, everyone sort of thinks it's very quick and like everyone's, you know, one night they're basically selling their company for a hundred billion dollars uh, after starting it. But as uh, I think you and I first met in like 2011 or so, and uh, this game is a long grind. So I'm glad to see you still grinding and uh, con congrats to all the continued success. Thank you. It's been eight years. So that's the overnight right there. <laughs> How does it feel to sort of be like, because, you know, you, you've you always been sort of known as, I mean, part of the sort of shtick about you is you are the, you know, this young guy, you're a teenager, you know, went to college when you were 14. You're, you're you know, you sort of, that's starting to change now that you're this, you're this you know, eight years into the grind. Have you felt the way that you're sort of, you've grown and involved over those eight years uh, change the way you talk about yourself? Yeah, I mean, the story changes every year. Uh, and this just happens when you get old, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, in the beginning, you use what you have. I always tell people, just use what you have. This was one of the cheat codes in my book, which was, you know, I was young and bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, coming from Canada, um, you know, skipped a bunch of grades. That was what I had. Now I have a track record, right? I have customers. I have a a business that people thought was going to be very difficult to build that we built successfully and continued to, 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 to build. And so 
you kind of just shift the story around. And then the, the focus becomes less about you and more on your team. Uh, just because your team is a lot more sustainable than you are, to be very frank, mm -hmm. um, especially not just sustainable, but scalable, mm -hmm. right? I can't be in a million places at once, but I, my team can be in four different cities at the same time. Um, so that's kind of how we pivoted around the messaging. Now, I think the, you know, I've actually recommended your book to quite a few people because what I, one of the things I love about the cheat code is it's sort of very digestible, you know, sort of, and, and was it intentional to write a book in this way that had this, I don't know, I'm just going to call like a way for someone to sort of pick it up and sort of like digest it quickly in the age of, you know, uh, Twitter and all those sorts of things. Was that sort of part of the design behind it? 100%. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I wanted something that people with, millennial uh, and Gen Y, Gen Z attention spans to be able to read back to front, front to back, middle, front, doesn't matter, and actually immediately have a takeaway, right? Um, there was a very uh, frustrating uh, realization after going through a lot of the other business books out there where it's like, first of all, a life story of a, like a 75-year-old billionaire <laughs> right. who invented things before the telephone was invented. And then you have, uh, you know, people who wanted you to upend your entire life, you know, and you're just like, this is not realistic, mm -hmm. right? Like I want something that I can do now. And so the whole point of the book is this shit in there you can do now. And that's uh, the real nut of it. And people really appreciate it because they try something right away and they see results and it's convincing Especially, you know, all the sheet codes in there about reaching out cold to people, right. LinkedIn adding, email, uh, cold emailing. I mean, all these different things uh, immediately makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's that was one of the things I, I enjoyed most about it. I, I was, I'll, I'll get to a couple of things, but I wanted to, one of the things that I, I, I did like early on in the book, you talk about this premise of getting in over your head. And I remember when we first met, you were talking about just some of the, the big name brands that you work with. I mean, the, the Pepsi's, the, you know, the Unilever, you're talking about big deal companies here when you're, you know, early in your life. Um, talk about that, that premise of getting in over your head and why you, why you find it to be so important. Yeah, you always want to feel like you're out of place. You always want to feel like you're biting more than you can chew. Um, obviously, there's dangerous situations. Uh, use your discretion. <laughs> it's funny because I always tell people, especially in the tech world, this is fine, right? But if you're like my sister-in-law, for example, she's an ophthalmologist, she's a doctor, uh, you can't really do that because people could die <laughs> in advertising. Oh God. Like, okay. You, you run an ad campaign where the click through rate is like, you know, 0.5% lower. It's like, you know, no one's going to die. Um, so it's, it's important to try. And what happens is when you try or you do, it stretches you, right? It pushes you to limits and you understand what your limits are and you understand what you're capable of. And people who don't try don't know that they're capable of these things. Um, and they also don't realize that it also gives them a huge benefit. When you do take the initiative, when you do get in over your head, people do recognize you and they do go to you for that. Uh, so it's funny. I tell people who are younger and in big organizations, I'm like, what's stopping you from being the blockchain expert in the company? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> because no one else knows anything about it. So you might as well just read up about it. And as long as you're reading and learning just a little faster than the next guy or gal, then you're, you're in, mm -hmm. right? Be and these are perfect opportunities to try to position yourself and, and not even as an expert, actually, that's the worst way to do it. Just position yourself as the doer, yeah. you know, just throw me a project. I'm going to, I'm just going to do it. And it's going to look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and that's the whole point. Yeah, be curious, right? I think it's better to what the, uh, the Satya Nadella be once, uh, learn it alls, not know it alls. Exactly. Well, so what was the, the, you know, you, you're running a company. I mean, you're still, you know, as, as you've, you shared, this is, you know, startups are always on the brink and challenging. And there's the next challenge as soon as you get past one milestone. What made you decide to, to work on a book here? I mean, it's, you know, there's obviously you, your time is already super limited. You're on a plane all the time. Uh, what was the decision to say, I think I need to write a book at this point? I think it's a, it was mainly because I really wanted a established body of content that I could refer to. Mm. 
for people who were very much so like me, but maybe a couple years before and needing that kind of additional kick. Uh, and I was getting a lot of similar questions and, you know, we're entrepreneurs. We like to be efficient. <laughs> so I was like, rather than repeating myself every time, here's a book. Uh, it was a little awkward at first because, you know, people ask the question, like, don't talk to me, read my book. I didn't do that. I would still obviously talk to them, but I was like, listen, it's almost like you can have a multi hour long conversation with me. Just check out some of these particular cheat codes that are relevant to you and blah, 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 blah. And the other thing is the content has always been swimming around in my head, right? I had mm -hmm. them written down in my Evernote. Um, you know, it was not hard, honestly, to start, you know, just putting them down on paper. Um, and then ultimately it was just wrapping a story around it. And, and the funny part was I was writing it during a six month period at, in, I think it was 2016, if I'm not mistaken. And 2016 was really a nut, nuts year, right? It still is. I mean, I always think about it as like, if I were right this year or last year, the year before that, doesn't matter. It would have had all these, <laughs> it would have the same type of frenetic energy that you could detect when you're reading the book, uh, just because this is how my lifestyle has evolved. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's and and uh, and I think that's partially, you know, like you said, there's there's sort of never a good time. I think you'd you'd probably though, if you were to describe it, I mean, you've been someone who's been a sought after speaker for a while. You've been saying a lot of these things. It just sort of was then probably, I'm guessing, a lot of it was pulling from notes, pulling from PowerPoint decks you'd given to start to pull these together um, into a book. Yeah, there's a lot of that. There's all those conversations with people that really kind of nudge me to make a point out of it. Um, you know, more well well known cheat codes like, like I said, the use what you have, the get it over your head, the uh, be a, be legendary, like all these different things. Um, we're just inspired by people that I talk to. Mostly, they give themselves a ton of excuses of why not to do something versus why to do something. And it's really kind of just edging people towards the why, why, just do it, right? It really, like, the asking one is my favorite. It's just like, you ask people for something and they say no. It's not like your life was any different before you asked the question. So <laughs> not ask the question, right. it really doesn't hurt. It, you have no downside, absolutely no downside. Um, and I still do this even to this day. Like, I'm in Boston today. I cold emailed, like, four people. Um, and I'm going to cold email more. And it's just like, I still do it because it's the best thing ever. Yeah. That's it. What about, uh, where did the, one of my favorites is get a signature haircut. What is your signature haircut then? <laughs> your trademark haircut. Yeah. As you can imagine, the whole point of that one was to sort of share that there's a brand, a personal brand that you want to develop that is, yes, partially about haircuts. It's more to identify that, you know, there's a lot of really famous world leaders, usually the not so good ones that seem to have hairdos <laughs> are very consistent. Um, there are then uh, leads to this conclusion that there's this personal branding that is important to maintain. It's consistent around what you represent as a person. So who, who, who can I go to for what, right? Um, and just even in life, you know, you have that friend who's really good at listening. You have that, you know, if you have any problems, you need a so shoulder to cry on, you know who to talk to. Or you have that friend who will always, you know, know where all the, the bars are, where the party's at. Same thing in the professional realm, right? There's people who, you know, are just amazing at branding, amazing at PR, you know, amazing at, um, you know, operations and whatever, you know? And so you want to make sure you keep that brand. Now you, you keep updating it, right? But it's important to sort of consistently invest in that because if you don't, people don't know what you represent, um, they're not going to go to you for anything. And you'd, you'd rather them go to you for something so at least you get the deal flow, you get people coming to you in the first place, which is why VCs as well, just to use a VC term, also build themselves under certain brands too, Right. Um, you know, the Fred Wilson brand is like the New York juggernaut, you know, is the nice guy, is the guy that people want to talk to who wants to create world changing ideas. And he gets these people coming to them. And now once you've established a brand, people just come to you consistently. Right. And that's that's the, the cool part of building that personal brand. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And how do you what's your signature? Do you have a name for your signature haircut? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to need one. We're going to call we're the B-dub. Is that what we'll call it, maybe? I'm going yeah, for it. That's what I'm going to call it. Sure, now. the B-dub haircut. There you go. Walk in. Hey, uh, hey, you know, I don't know what my haircutter's name is, but I'm going to say, can I get the B-dub? Uh, <laughs> so how does it feel? You started this company in, you know, 2010. And at the time, you know, sort of video games had, I wouldn't say they'd gone mainstream in some senses of the word, but today, you know, I mean, it's sort of, we've popped, right, in terms of Twitch and Fortnite and all these sorts of things. How does it feel to sort of be right on a trend? Now, now whether that means otherwise, but you've sort of been right on the fact that this is becoming part of the cultural lexicon. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things where you can certainly refer to your long history of having been consistently on the same, you know, banging the same drum, which is what I've been doing. Um, it's... It's, it feels good, but honestly, it, it's about capitalizing on it still, right? So until we get to 100 million in revenue, you know, I don't think I'm right. Mm -hmm. And even at 100, I don't even think I'm right either. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would want to do more. We would always want to do more. But it is a, a, it is, it is definitely a good feeling, but also, you also need to be worried about whether or not things will change. And this is, this is, I think this helps hopefully your students and your, your listeners get a peek into the mind of an entrepreneur, which is you're, you're never satisfied, right? You're always looking around the corner and you know, you know, this rule too, and you're running your, your business is just like, if everything seems to be too good, something's wrong, right? <laughs> Something, Something is wrong. Is wrong. Yeah. And it, it, this is why we'll never have like mental peace, right? We'll always be there going like, Oh God, like, there has to be something brewing. And then you go look around in the corner in the closet under, underneath the carpet. And then you, and you do find something. And, and, and what you do is you also list out all the risks, right? You know, there's literally a risks mitigation document that I've put together with my exec team. Mm -hmm. And this is just to give them a peek. At, I said, listen, <laughs> these are all our industry risks. And I'll say it right out. You know, a uh, header bidding in app, which is too long for me to explain, but that's another uh, risk right now in our, in our space. Uh, you've got GDPR for for in the U.S. potentially being a risk. Mm -hmm. You've got all these other things, and you know, you you put these things together, and and um, it's just a good. I think it's a healthy way to understand that nothing is all you know, sort of uh, you know Cinderella stories. You, 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 there's always going to be challenges, and you have to. Uh, make sure you're aware of them. So you don't, you're not the stupid person who's got, who got caught. You don't want to get caught. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. I had, I had, I had, uh, I have two kids now and my wife and I always jokingly say it's too quiet right now. Yeah. <laughs> and so whenever this weekend I said that, and there was my, my daughter, uh, Parker's too, had found a crayon and decided that she wanted to color, uh, our entire fridge, uh, with a red crayon. <laughs> so I got really good at some elbow grease there, but yeah, I think the same applies in life, man. Uh, business particular is like when it's too quiet, something, uh, something's on the horizon. It's coming. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. Exactly. Oh, uh, that's awesome. So, um, one of the, one of the things that I think you've uh, you spend a lot of time in the cheat code talking about is this concept of of reaching out and kind of basically like leveling up, being being able to get out access and. As I shared with you, for a lot of the people that I'm working with, they're early in this kind of journey of creating something, a book, a podcast, a video series, whatever it is. And part of the magic is getting access to people. Talk a little bit about what you've learned and how to kind of hack the system, the cheat code. You have a number of cheat codes in there about kind of cold emails and using LinkedIn and stuff like that. Give me a few things that people do today to get your attention, for example, if they wanted to interview you for their book or for their podcast or whatever. What are some of the cheat codes you see today most effective? Yeah, I think there's, it's a lot there. I mean, if it's, it, you want to be memorable is the first and foremost. You want to have something, it, it, not just important to say, but something that comes from a unique perspective. People want to hear that. Um, I think there's just too many content creators. I mean, this is already something people know. You know, what makes you unique? What makes people want to listen to you? Uh, and then I think that's like the number one question. Um, and then try to do something unique, but it is hard, right? So I'll tell you when I first talked to my publisher, you can imagine, I was like, yeah, let's do like an app and let's do like an app where the book starts in a physical form and ends in a digital form. And I had this like interactive thing I, ha I wanted to do. And I was like, 
no, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. That's <laughs> not how the, the, the industry works. Uh, you know, we print books and we ship a lot of them and they go into stores and people buy them with their credit cards. And it's just like, <laughs> that's just it. And so mm-hmm. there is some constraints and you have to work around it. But yeah, I pushed the envelope. I said, yeah, I, I want like 70 chapters. <laughs> There's like, mm-hmm. what? And I'm like, yeah, I want some 70, 70 chapters and I want them to be like 500 words each. They're like, what? <laughs> and so, yeah, this is some stuff you had to really, you know, push. So it, it was fun. Um, and then disseminating the content. The thing I learned too was, was around promoting. It's, it's really hard. Uh, yeah. you know, people, uh, you know, you would assume that again, like just cause your book is in shelves means that things are, you know, life is great. Uh, the, no, in fact, no one cares if your book is in shelves. <laughs> um, they would need to know what you represent, uh, who endorses you, who's talking about you and where to find you. Um, and so that's why speaking circuit is a big part of it. Um, and so my attitude has always been, well, not always, but in the early days and even when the book came out, I was always going to take anything and everything. Right. Mm. I think a lot of people are really, full of themselves. They're just like, oh, I'm bigger than this. I'm not going to speak in front of an audience of 20 people. I want mm-hmm. an audience of a thousand people. But like, well, you'll never know who's in that audience of 20 people. Right. And what happens is um, I've had so many examples of going to an event and God, I'm just like sit, sit in front of an audience and it's depressing. There's like 20 people. But there's two people in the audience who are like running another conference that you know has 10,000 people. And they're just like, you did such a great job. We want to recruit you to this other event. And like one thing leads to another and then bam, you get this ridiculous um, sort of moment. So these can, it, it's just cascading and it happens over and over and over. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason why you always never, you never want to let your guard down. You never want to half ass something. Um, and life will give you a lot of, a lot of benefits in return. Mm-hmm. A lot. I, it's not that hard. I keep on telling people, if you just don't be a lazy shit, you work really hard when you, and you, and you give it an opportunity, you put your full into it, even if it doesn't seem like it's going to be a big opportunity and you put all your energy into it, you will get so many returns. It's, it's not even fine. What do you talk about a, a few places? You talk about this concept of your superpower, like finding your superpower in, in this thing. And in this world, I think today where you talk about the, everyone talks about finding their purpose or whatever it is. Why do you like the word superpower so much? Yeah, it, it really denotes the fact that everyone was either born with or nurtured and learned or has this superpower that they should be investing a lot of energy and time into really sharpening and making amazing because uh, it's the thing that will differentiate you. And every superhero has that superpower that everyone knows about. And, you know, what is the superpower that you have? And I think that's, it's, it's it. And it's nothing to do with your passion. Nothing. That's why it's the passion part is really frustrating because it's misleading, right? It's like you wake up in the morning, like I'm passionate about mm. mobile advertising and changing mobile. Like, no, that's not <laughs> <laughs> like, no, let's not kid ourselves. That's not my passion. My, my passion is creating products that upend traditional industries and make people think twice and that's the reason why it's exciting every day because I get to see the product in action and I get to see people change their minds about what works and what doesn't work. And then also my superpowers I mentioned in a lot of my talks is I'm really good at getting people super excited about stuff and really rallying you know, uh, a group of people around a, a single idea and a single uh, initiative. So people need to find that. And the thing is they need to realize it isn't nothing to do with uh, what they grew up learning as well. Sometimes, yeah. like if you like, you know, if you were in a, you took accounting and in, 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 in school doesn't mean your passion as accounting. It doesn't mean you have to be an accountant. But what behind that motivated you? Maybe you're very excited about really, really big, uh, you know, groups of numbers and detecting patterns and and try to you know find that needle in a haystack and, and do it much faster than everyone else. Then that means that might be your superpower and let's see how that can apply to anything else that you do. Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, 
concept behind also just allocating energy to that rather than allocating energy to something you know you're just never going to be really good at. Like I'm never going to be good at calculus. <laughs> Why would I ever put any time into to? It's not like that's going to help me. And I can always work with someone who's really good at it, right? And that's the whole point is that in the world of teamwork and collaboration, you want to work closely with people who are who have superpowers that are complementary to yours. It's funny you picked accounting. So I have, a, I have a young woman named Danielle who's working on a book. She's an accounting major, and she's writing a book about uh, all the cool things that people have who had an accounting degree went on to do. And surprisingly, there's a large number of comedians who are also accountants. So there you go. <laughs> Speaking of, that they're is closeted, super powerful. They need an outlet for all the humor <laughs> that they cannot express when they're in front of them. <laughs> There you go, man. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Wong, I appreciate you spending some quality time with me today. I know you're a busy, busy man. And, uh, and so I appreciate you dropping some knowledge bombs on, uh, on all these wise people today. Uh, what else can people do to support you and your major efforts today besides buying the book and, um, and championing you on the Twitters? Um, that's really it. You know, uh, follow me on, on social media. Um, I write a lot of articles on Inc. I'm a, a columnist there. A lot of the articles are kind of extensions of the topics I discuss in the book. So there's a lot there. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of fun stuff to, to check out constantly. Awesome. You are the man, sir. I appreciate it always and uh, keep being awesome.